Um, yeah, so my, um, my sort of discipline, if you like, we were talking about silos um, at the first half of this. Um, I deal with Mediterranean prehistory, mostly late Bronze Age and early Iron Age. Um, I say Mediterranean because I do try to cover the entire thing. Yeah. Um, radiocarbon dating, um, methods of radiocarbon dating based on statistics are not my field, but I am having to wade through them um, in debates that seriously affect um, my ability to um, do big picture Mediterranean scale research. Um, so this is what I'll be talking about. Um, the fact that there is no such thing as an absolute chronology. Sorry. Um, <laughs> um, why research at the Mediterranean scale um, is so impacted by um, our understandings of time and our understandings of chronologies. Um, how time is warped, both um, in terms of actual theoretical physics, but also in terms of human experience. Um, the key to understanding time is actually how we measure it and how we measure it affects our conceptions of it um, and therefore how we use it in, uh, in archaeology. Um, I'll then come on to um, a, a fairly big <laughs> problem for me, which is um, the various high and low chronology debates that um, happen in various parts of the Mediterranean Basin during my study period. Um, my PhD is specifically looking at um, 1500 to 500 BC, so a good period of a thousand years, and there are several times where people do not agree with each other. Um, and also I will have some suggestions for how we move forward from this um, and how we actually get to the, what archaeology is really about. It's, it's looking at people and understanding people in their time and people in their place. <coughs> so, uh, there is no such thing as an absolute chronology. Um, so, uh, absolute chronology is, is it's essentially a, a relative chronology, but it's based on our conception of time rather than materials that we deal with. So. Quite often you would say a relative chronology, particularly in the Mediterranean, if it's based on ceramics or if it's based on um, culture history, as we've just had an expert demonstration of. Um, yes, those are relative chronologies in a broad scale. What we class as absolute chronology is actually relative. It's just allocating dates, times to these things in order to put them in a certain order. Um, I am going to stray into theoret theoretical physics, so I do apologise. Um, Einstein did a, a series of thought experiments in um, attempting to prove um, some of the theories of Isaac Newton wrong, um, and they're great experiments, um, but also uh, really disappointing <laughs> experiments um, when you're trying to deal with um, Mediterranean comparisons. Um, so. He had this particular experiment, um, which was a, um, he imagined a man standing on a train platform, um, and just in front of him, two strikes of lightning occur at the same time. And he, he's standing there, he can see them, they happen together. He then said, okay, so that, that's what that person is seeing. What about a person who is on a train pulling into the platform? How did they see them? And the answer to that is the person on that train will see the closer lightning strike first because of the way that light travels. And then they will see the second one. So there, um, what is simultaneous depends on how you are moving in that instance. Um, it depends on where you are standing in relation to what is happening. Um, and it means that the flow of time is not the same for everyone. Um, different observers <coughs> can't agree on what is simultaneous. Um, and different observers then can't agree on, on the flow of time itself. So there is no such thing as simultaneity. 
um, which means there's no such thing as absolute time. Um, and that was, that was Einstein proving um, Newton wrong about um, theories of uh, light. Um, so this is, this is his theory of special relativity, which is uh, time and space are flexible depending on how you are moving. Um, and in thinking about this, it became sort of one um, conglomerate of, of space-time, which you talk about a lot. Um, space-time um, means that time has a geometry, um, that this shape that it has um, creates gravity. So objects in space-time um, cause the objects warp space-time and then space-time causes those objects to move, which we feel the effects of as gravity. Yeah, I'm not a physicist either, sorry. <laughs> um, so um, that kind of, um, that's a sort of small summary of this, this theory of general relativity. Um, so in, in theoretical physics, um, at the minute, has, has everyone seen the film The Theory of Everything? Yeah. Um, basically, they're after a theory of everything now because they need to reconcile general relativity, um, this theory that um, matter tells space-time to curve and then space-time tells matter to move. They need to reconcile that with um, quantum mechanics in theoretical physics. This is the big scale and the very, very small scale. Um, and this sort of theory of everything is they're after a single set of rules that apply both to the cosmic and to the atomic scales. Um, a sort of unified theory of like a holy, holy grail of physics. Um, so the, the one thing I think about this is when we talk in archaeology about scientific methodologies, um, it's slightly problematic um, in that, okay, it might be a, a particular kind of science, but it's a science that's also ignoring another kind of science, which is the theoretical physics side of things. Um, yeah, so, and it kind of shows us that what we're dealing with here in terms of time is um, problems of scale. So, the Mediterranean scale. Um, there is a long history of uh, comparative Mediterranean research um, from Ferdinand Braudel, um, the future Holden Purcell, that the corrupted sea is 2000, I think, um, and um, Cyprian Budbank applying um, Holden and Purcell's idea of um, Mediterranean connectivity to prehistory. Um, connectivity is the sort of the big uh, paradigm for dealing with um, research on the Mediterranean scale. Um, it's developed in response to previous emphasis on both exchange and directionality in Mediterranean networks. Um, the basin, quote, derives unity and cohesion less from the, its network of routes in the Braudelian sense than from the more general connectivity of its micro regions. That's from Horn and Purcell. Um, so this connectivity is multi-directional, multi-scalar, multifarious social interaction um, as a response to uh, shared topogra topographical fragmentation and the uneven distribution of resources, uh, shared climactic and environmental uncertainty, and shared risk. Um, so as a theoretical framework, it is central to understanding a dynamic Mediterranean past, um, bringing um, mobility and social relations to the fore, and facilitating a, facilitating a sort of wider and um, more detailed cross-cultural and comparative study within the Mediterranean. Um, this is a particular problem um, when it comes to dealing with chronologies because, as we've heard, nothing is simultaneous. Nothing happens at the same time. It's all about perspective and it's all about scale. Um, <laughs> so my particular research um, is actually seeking to reframe connectivity in terms of human relations rather than the focus on materials and our understanding of uh, culture and society as 
shared, imagine, shared imagined realities or lived fictions, but that's for an entirely separate talk. Um, the problem that I face is that historical narrative and analysis at the Mediterranean scale depends on understanding degrees of contemporaneity, but we know from Einstein that there's no such thing. Um, so time is experienced. Um, time is warped, as we've already discussed. So matter tells space time to curve. Space time tells matter to move. Um, and gravity is the curving of space and time. Time is warped. Um, but time is also warped at the human scale. Um, anyone um, who listens to music, plays music, is a musician, knows that time is experienced. It's not counted. So in classical music, you have a term called rubato, um, which is about taking a little bit of time in one place and spending it somewhere else. In jazz music, it's called swing. In rock music, in funk music, it's called groove. There's all these different genres have their own way of describing not, not being on that click track the whole time. And that it is that um, experience of time, that experience of um, the flexibility of time that is key to the experience of, of music and human experience, I would say. Though I am biased, sorry. Um, yeah, I thought I'd just put that picture up because Wibbly Wobbly Tiny Wimey was also a really good session title. Uh, oh. No, all my pictures have gone. Oh no. Sorry, I did have pictures on there. Don't know where they've gone. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so the pictures that I had up there, um, were about how we measure time um, and measuring time as an experience of time. Um, I'm currently at Cambridge, which is weird enough isn't it, in itself, but it also has an incredibly weird and wonderful array of large clocks and timepieces, um, none of which work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's this particularly ugly sculpture that I did have a um, uh, a picture of called the Corpus Clock, which is cost sort of several millions of pounds. It's a bright, shiny gold thing with this really ugly cricket on the top of it, and all the tourists stand in front of it and generally get run over by bicycles or in the way. Um, and it's this huge thing. They spent so much money on it. It was, you know, it was a grand unveiling by Stephen Hawking, and it's only accurate every five minutes. You spend that amount of money on something that measures your own conception of time that still isn't right. <laughs> it still can't do it all the time. Um, the other example I was going to show was um, a sundial, actually, which is built onto the side of my college, um, which has a really unusual feature I've not seen before, um, to one side, which shows the variation, depending on the month of the year, as to how fast or slow the sundial is. So the, the sun doesn't move, doesn't get faster or slower. That's not, uh, like, that is, that is how we, I take that as a representation of how we measure time from natural phenomena, but actually we are trying to force natural phenomena into our own conception, our own version of time, which, I take as a parallel to radiocarbon dating because we are using something that is not our measure of time. It is, um, but we are using it to measure our sense of time. Um, so we've got to the point where the passage of time and therefore the nature of chronology is not static. It changes according to how and where it is measured. Um, where is, to me, the question of perspective and scale? Um, the how is the archaeological methodologies um, that we use to measure it, and 
it is rooted in the materials, archaeological materials. Um, and naturally, ar archaeological material methodologies um, always come with their own biases, always. Um, so that can be the selection of the material, the collection of it, the sampling strategies, the analyses, the interpretations. At every single stage of this process, there is um, leeway, shall we say. Um, yeah, sorry, I don't have any pictures here either. Um, so, um, the tyranny of pottery, as I've called it. Um, in the Mediterranean, as with the Bulgarian examples we've just shown, um, the correlation tables for ceramics are universal. They are everywhere. Everywhere it has their own, um, you know, even if you're looking at a specific region, it will have all the, the, the correlations between ceramic styles. If you're then looking between regions, they will have broader. Um, I had examples up, but obviously not now. Um, and the pottery, it, like it, it is a, a culture historical hangover for us. Sorry, um, um, but it's used for um, for dating. It's used to understand contact and therefore simultaneity. Um, and it's also used for phasing stratigraphy. It is integral to so much of what. Um, is done in um, Mediterranean archaeology. Um, the particular high and low chronology debate that I'm going to focus on is a headache for me anyway, is um, the presence of late protogeometric Aegean pottery, um, which is traditionally dated to the uh, 10th century. The Aegean has um, a very robust and um, um, long-standing um, relative pottery chronology. Um, this kind of pottery is recovered in Levantine strata that are traditionally dated to the 11th century, the earlier. Um, and the use of uh, carbon-14 and Bayesian statistics in the Levant um, has sort of continued this disparity in the evidence. It's not made anything clearer. Um, they've gone from um, what was originally termed the uh, Crowfoot Kenyan chronology, um, then they had a high chronology, and then there was a Finkelstein low chronology, and then someone revised it. And it's essentially the same two sides, just shifting slightly each time they get a new date or new evidence, but they're still polarized at one end. They're trying to answer the same question, and they're not getting anywhere. Um, So the, the, one of the big issues in particular um, in, the, in the text when they're talking about these dates is um, the period between um, the end of Iron Age, Iron Age 1 and the beginning of Iron Age 2. Um, but there is no talk within their um, work about what this break is. Is it ceramics? Is it wider material culture? Is it phases of occupation of sites? Is it actually the presence of things that I'm looking at, which is the introduction of um, the changing in cremation and inhumation practices? Um, quite often, you'll see that the, the designation of change is, oh, they've started cremating now. This is the new phase. So they've, while I'm trying to find the date for the cremation, it's the cremation that is providing the date, which is um, just a pain. Um, <laughs> They have um, huge, huge problems with stratigraphy. Um, I quote, the original stratigraphic assignment was sometimes adjusted on the basis of the carbon-14 results. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so you basically have, um, have a situation where archaeologists aren't really doing their job, where the, the stratigraphy that our primary resource our primary resource is being ignored we are focusing on materials we're focusing on pottery we are focusing on scientific techniques radiocarbon dating basing in analysis to give us answers rather than actually pitting, picking apart stratigraphy 
properly. And I know, I know, the sites, a lot of the sites were done a long time ago. They had different methodologies. Um, and also, I know sites can be confusing. But when this is literally every single major site that you are doing carbon-14 dating on in order to produce a chronology that is affecting the whole of the Mediterranean, um, we, we really need better work. Um, 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 yeah. Uh, in terms of Bayesian analysis, I'll just um, I had one picture, which is this one here. I'll pass it round if you want to see it. But basically, Bayesian analysis is um, is the one thing within Levantine radiocarbon dating that um, supports the low chronology. So the um, they will do the, the radiocarbon date, they'll have a peak for the low chronology, a peak for the high chronology, and the Bayesian analysis says low chronology. So at what point do you follow one and not the other? Uh, yes, that's why that's up there. Um, yeah, another thing that's really just generally not helpful is that people are vitriolic about this. They're really, really nasty to each other in print. and to the extent that I just want to bash heads together and <laughs> scream at them to behave. Um, like, I, yeah. I don't, I don't see um, the sort of repeatedly publishing the same data and arguments with responses to arguments and replies to responses to arguments. Um, it's, it's so circular and I would seriously question the editorial decision to allow, frankly, bitchy comments um, like these into academic publishing, it's just, it's not solving any any questions at all. Um, so yeah, moving forward. Um, the important thing is for there to be a level of respect for the advances that scientific methodologies have contributed to understanding um, archaeological chronologies. And as um, both Susan and Anna have, have made the point that when, you know, you're not seeking to subvert entirely work that has been done. It is good work, and it is a great place to bounce off of. Um, but there has to be a, a sort of not not the, the sort of combative um, attempt to change people's ideas and change people's work, but actually a slightly more reflective um, spiral of interpretation, as Susan had. Um, yeah. Um, the problem with the high and low chronology debates is that the act of dating something, um, of, of giving it a specific place in time, has become its own like raison d'etre. Um, how something is dated should be inseparable from the questions of why and where, the questions of perspective and scale in our analysis. We've come a long way from reliance on labels of time that stem from technological differences. So the fact that we still use terms like Neolithic, Bronze Age, Iron Age. Um, comparative approaches in the Mediterranean and continental Europe demonstrate how these labels of time are no longer really fit for purpose beyond a generalized, a very generalized shorthand. Um, and this was something that I think came up um, in the Parallel Worlds um, session that was on yesterday. Um, so how can big picture research like mine in the Mediterranean reconcile chronologies at different scales? Um, despite their problems, narratives by numbers are a way forward um, in that they allow us to talk about time on a more human rather than a material scale. Um, in my own research, I am breaking down evidence over periods of 100 years, so approximately four generations. Um, and this is something that has been done um, before with the Invisible Dead project at Durham, um, Jenny Bradbury and uh, Mandy Jay, uh, looking at big data and big picture in Roman Britain and Bronze Age Levant. Um, so one of the things that I particularly hope to elucidate through my approach um, is actually whether or not the Med's high versus low chronology debate or uh, debates really make any difference in how we understand processes of change that are visible in the archaeological record. Uh, thank you.